What turn of events could lead to a dog's name to be censored? All because its owner, Wing Commander Guy Gibson, did not have the foresight to predict the translation he would choose for the word black would happen to be the one that would be judged over 80 years in the future not to be politically correct by the very organisation Guy Gibson embodies, the Royal Air Force. There is nothing fundamentally offensive by that combination of letters at its very essence, but it strikes me that we have forgotten that a word alone cannot be offensive. We have seem to have forgotten that a word can only be offensive when used in conjunction with other words forming its context. If the opposite were true, the word would be offensive no matter the context, or the other words placed around it, and we wouldn't be able to say, its use there in that specific way is not offensive. Clearly, we can say that even with this word. Another problem we seem to have created for ourselves is empowering the word through censorship. When a word is held as taboo, its utterance becomes more shocking. When we are dealing with words that can be used as racist terminology, do we really want to empower them in such a way? Do we really want to give more shock factor to the racists who use the word in an utterly shameful and abusive way. I unfortunately feel that over the years, as the word has become less common, we have in some way empowered it, and regrettably so. The word itself, black, is a colour, and nigger comes from the Latin for black. Nigger or Nigrios, which itself bears irony for the Royal Air Force, whose mottos are more likely to appear in Latin than their native English. Where have we ended up where just the action of translating the word black into another language could cause so much trouble? And when did we all reach an agreement that this translation is where we draw the line? Is it just the Latin translation that is universally offensive? Or the Spanish translation, Negro? Is that problematic too? Perhaps the Finnish, Muster? Or the Afrikaans, Swart? Of course, we are still intelligent enough to agree that the power behind the word can be in the historical context of how it has been used. We can agree that the word has been used as a horrible racial slur, but the key point is that it has been used, not that it has always been used as a racial slur. In fact, the English black is currently one of the most acceptable terms to use when referring to someone of native African heritage. When it comes to slavery, African people have had their struggles. Most of us agree that the slave trade in African lives, transporting them west in inhuman conditions, was totally abhorrent. However, this plight was not exclusive to African victims. There are examples of African on African slavery continuing to this day as well as Africans keeping white Europeans as slaves, and examples of virtually every culture on the planet keeping slaves of both their own and different cultural heritage. Unfortunately, as a human race, this is our history. And what should be greater concern, sometimes our present. So, I am far from saying it is over. In fact, it surprises me that the Black Lives Matter movement is more focused on reparations for them, the black community, for the atrocities of previous generations, than any hint of helping anyone forced in slavery right now. 
although slavery exists in the modern day, we have, in my opinion, progressed significantly from those dark times. And there probably isn't a time in history where slavery, prejudice and racism isn't as unacceptable as it is now. This is true progress. Unfortunately, I propose that we have now created another problem. We are actually overcompensating for the mistakes of the past. One example is how black Afro-Americans have taken ownership of the word nigger. On the face of it, it is something that should be applauded as positive progress. This has actually turned the word in this context from a racial slur to a term of endearment. But this brings about another problem. As we begin to qualify this as endearment, not by its context, but rather by the race of the person using it. Are we actually saying one race has the unqualified right to use a word and others do not? Is this progress? Is it progress when we judge the use of a word for a colour, not by its context, not by its presence in a sequence of other words, not on the intent of the speaker, but on the race of the person using it? Could this become a spectrum where at one end we afford a race the right to use a word and at the other removing that right from another race and we afford other human rights selectively for people according to their race? Isn't this exactly the same thing we are fighting against? The right to do and say things being based purely on race. History is often said to be written by the victors, and recent events have seen words embargoed and monuments desecrated as if we are attempting to rewrite our history. As humans, we cannot doubt our racist past, but we are moving so fast that we are beginning to attempt to rewrite our history as if this was the winning result of a race war. To me, this is very scary. Imagine, if you will, a statue of Jimmy Savile being taken down at this moment. One would think the majority of people would agree that such a monument should be removed. Because as time has progressed, we have learned that that person was responsible for horrific crimes against children. However, when we imagine this happening, we think of it as being the result of an informed, but crucially, democratic process. However, when it comes to tearing down racist symbols, we seem to be doing so without any democratic process at all. Is it progressive when we allow minority, racially motivated groups to take such actions against historical symbols? In the case of the monument at Scampton, there seems to have been no public consultation or democratic process implemented at all when it came to the alteration of such a symbol of historical importance. As many people saw, I ran a Twitter poll asking how many people agreed or disagreed with the decision. While I don't profess that this sample is representative of public opinion, isn't there something to be learned from 90% of people disagreeing with this decision? We are in danger of becoming submissive to the rule of the mob and abandoning the democratic process that we value and have fought for so hard. We are now in a position where we are having to protect our national monuments in case a mob decides to damage or remove them. To be clear, this is a crime. This is criminal damage. A law that we have passed through a democratic process that minority groups are attempting to circumvent in the name of progress? It's absurd. Fortunately, our historical monument here 
is behind the security fence of an active military base, and as such is at lower risk of defacement. However, this may be used as an excuse to justify its replacement. If this is the case, we are literally saying as a society that we are living in imminent fear that a minority group will decide to take undemocratic action, committing a crime to desecrate a historical monument. Isn't that a scary place to you? It is to me, but I tell you what, it makes me more empowered to stand up and say this is wrong. This is illegal. If you want change, then make change within our free society, within the boundaries of the laws of our land and through the democratic process that underpins our country. Our history as a human race does not make easy reading, but learning from the mistakes of our past is vital in our efforts to ensure we are not condemned to repeat them. Are we simply being lazy in censoring these awkward historical facts? It's not an easy conversation to have with an inquiring child asking about the history of the word nigger or the inquiry from a young, black, RAF recruit walking past a monument and seeing the word nigger carved into stone. But do we simply change it because it is easier or more comfortable? Or do we become more comfortable as a society at actually having these uncomfortable conversations and confronting these mistakes in our past? Isn't the child or young recruit not better equipped with this knowledge to help defeat prejudice and racism that they may encounter? Is it better to bring them up in a culture of ignorance to these issues or to empower them with the knowledge of our past and the confidence to discuss these issues? These things are not comfortable to discuss. When we are dealing with the mistakes of humanity, only someone with psychopathic or sociopathic tendencies is not going to have an emotional response to some of the horrific things humans have done to other humans. Yet I think so much can be learned from this emotional journey we all go through. And it's how we exercise our basic instincts of what is right and wrong with those instincts being so important in our lives when we are faced with a decision about what is the right and wrong thing to do to another human being. Sanitizing our experiences can only have two effects. Either we become less likely to be able to distinguish between right or wrong, or on the other end of the scale, become so sensitive to our overwhelming emotion when we have to face such decisions that our emotions cloud our judgment, have significant physiological effects on the body and psychological effects on the mind. We are in no doubt that society is changing, but are we changing so fast that we are abandoning the rights and freedoms we hold dear in favour of repeating mistakes of the past? It is becoming almost fashionable to advance political correctness and equality issues. Government organisations, private organisation and even food brands are falling over themselves to appear progressive and politically correct. Falling over themselves to signal their virtue and be on the right side of current and often fashionable thinking. Could this be a factor in the decision to replace the monument in question? I fear this could be a stunt to further the career of an individual or signal the virtue of the Royal Air Force as an organisation. I hope I am wrong. Unfortunately, we are in an age where some people believe this strategy is advantageous. Long gone are the days where we do something because it's the right thing to do, rather than it being a great way to signal our virtue over Facebook, Twitter, TikTok or Instagram? Are we losing the motivation to take action based on personal judgment 
or what is right and wrong in favour of public image? Another dangerous and slippery slope. This is especially relevant in the current era of cancel culture. We used to believe that making mistakes was part of growing up, learning and development. Unfortunately, thanks to the internet and technology, everything is recorded for public scrutiny, either now or in the future. Had Guy Gibson been alive, he would have no doubt learned a lesson about how an action 80 years in the past can firmly be judged in the context of today's morality. This is one of the reasons why I felt so compelled to speak. As I'm unemployed due to disability, I perhaps have less to lose if what I say here isn't deemed to be correct by everyone out there. There are so many people that dare not speak out anymore and stand up for what they believe because it could have very real impacts on their private life, family life careers and sometimes even freedoms. In absence of these silent voices, sweeping changes are happening. We have removed the ability to politely challenge someone's statement and persuade someone using words that what they say might not be correct. Instead, we seem to seek out those who share a progressive opinion, form a self-policing mob, and go after these people until we force people in power to take drastic action against the individual. Of course, more and more people with this mentality are working their way into positions of power and influence so that they can take the action directly. With progressives in position of power and the voice of the majority repressed in fear, we have entered a dark time. Time so dark that we are actually in a place now where the authorities assign people with protected characteristics. These are things like race, sexual orientation and gender. If someone from a group with protected characteristics deems anything someone says is offensive, the police have a duty to record it as a black mark against that person for using hate speech. There is no burden of proof to be met, no investigation that needs to take place, no law that needs to be broken, and no trial that needs to take place. All of those rights of the accused have been withdrawn, and the only person that has to deem those words as hate speech for it to be recorded as such by the police is the accuser. This isn't a warning about where we are heading. This is a warning about what has happened in this country and where we are right now. You can now simply accuse anyone of hate speech and the police record it against the person you accuse. And if that person applies for a job requiring a police check because as part of the job they come in contact with a child or vulnerable person, it can be disclosed to their employer at the discretion of the chief constable. We have become so quick to be offended, perhaps because we are sanitising ourselves to emotional reactions as I previously described, or perhaps being offended is yet another way to signal our virtue to others. Nevertheless, we seem to have forgotten that causing offence is not necessarily an offence in law. Within the confines of the law, we are free to cause offence to others and there is a wide spectrum of what may offend one person compared to another. In fact, so obsessed are we with offence that we are now prejudging things, such as this memorial, as possibly offensive, and taking drastic action to prevent this hypothetical possibility from occurring. So horrific is this future hypothetical potential offence we are prepared to replace a memorial that has stood since 1943 to safeguard against it. It's almost as if one person's spared offence is justification to take action that offends thousands more. So what logical test is applied to decide if it's right or wrong? Well, it's what's current fashionable 
politically correct thinking at this very moment in time. If the powers that be had done this every year since its creation, would the memorial have been swapped out for a new one every year according to current thinking, as public opinion naturally flip-flops to the left and right of political centrism in a Western democracy? Will we see regular replacements in future as public opinion is continually assessed by an individual inside the wire that holds a certain position within the RAF? Although those responsible for placing that memorial in the first place gave their lives, or at the very least blood, sweat and tears for our hard-earned freedom from a fascist regime, I cannot help but ask, what are we doing with it? And what right do we have to mess with it? There is also worrying dictatorial element to all of this. We have seen it with the Black Lives Matters movement and taking a knee. Because they believe they are right, then everyone who doesn't comply must be wrong and branded a racist. There is no room anymore for individual choice of critical thinking. If you don't take the knee, then you are a racist. If you're not part of their solution, then you're part of their problem. They are using peer pressure, fear and shame to spread compliance. Even though through anonymous polling, we often see that the majority don't fully agree. It doesn't seem to affect their dictatorial messages. And they seem to be empowered by creating a silent majority. Of course, a majority doesn't matter if they are wrong, and our methods will help us ensure silence. I can't help thinking that with the passage of time, some of the most important lessons we learned as a society are becoming lost, and we are actually starting to display some of the fascist tendencies that they, not we, fought so hard against in this exact period of history where this dog got his name. Are we striving to create a society that allocates permitted words to different racial groups, that starts to create a censored list of words no matter the context they are used in, making them completely unutterable? A society that judges how words have been used in the past, ignoring how they are being used now. A society that dare not discuss the mistakes of the past, let alone be able to learn from them. A society that sanitises their written words based on the views of a minority of people viewed as the most progressive amongst us without questioning where that progression is leading us. A society that is scared of the consequences of simply discussing taboo topics or ideas, even though they may be held by the majority of the people, and in case the authorities on such matters may hear it and take away our livelihood, rights or income, if those words and ideas don't fit around the ones that are authorised. A society where you are the problem if you don't comply. A society where we shout about progressive ideas as loud as we can to demonstrate we toe the line, never make mistakes, and do good all of the time. A society that awards people with powers according to their race, sexuality or gender, and allows them to decide what words are hateful, and allows the police to keep a score of how many times you might have said something one of these protected groups has said is hateful. A society which makes offence an offence, without the passage of any law in the name of progress. A society that has started to allow a minority group holding the same opinion to systematically sanitise historical monuments and depictions of words according to their own code, without public consultation or democratic process. A society that judges decisions made by heroes of the country as if they were making those decisions now, with all the knowledge we currently have as if they had always had the gift through travel through time. A society so focused on the dog who cannot be named, we have completely lost the ability to listen to these important figures 
from our history. I completely agree this word can be used offensively and I will always stand up against that when it is. But can't we also agree using it as a name for a dog during that period in history probably had no racist intent? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the turn of events that led to a dog's name to be censored because its owner, Wing Commander Guy Gibson, didn't have the foresight to predict the translation he chose for the word black would happen to be the one that would be judged in over 80 years time in the future to be not politically correct by the very organisation Guy Gibson embodies, the Royal Air Force. So I ask you this, does this sound like a society that is progressing to something better or a society beginning to resemble the fascism that rather than submit to, those brave airmen fought to fight against. As we are busy, some 80 years later, judging when Commander Guy Gibson's actions in choosing a name for his beloved dog, have we perhaps missed the more important question? How would he judge us? And what would he say about the direction we are going in? <laughs>